Hi, this is James Barris. I hope you find this talk supports you in your practice. If you'd like to support my teaching, you can use the donate button underneath my picture on Dharma Seed to do that. Your support is greatly appreciated. If you haven't been coming here, <clears throat> we'll, we've been going through a series of talks um, on uh, different Theravadan Buddhist masters that are written up in a book that was called, when I got this copy, Living Buddhist Masters, is now uh, called Living Dharma, that Jack Cornfield put together, of 12 different masters, mostly, f uh, all actually, from uh, Burma and Thailand, <clears throat> Theravadan, the lineage, the, the way of the elders, and... Um, he, Jack wrote an introduction to each and then followed by that master's, either a talk by that master or, uh, or one of his students, um, mostly in the words of the master, uh, on different approaches to practice. Twelve different masters with twelve different uh, practices. And I hope that if you've been coming, you get the idea that there's many different ways to practice mindfulness meditation. The masters that we've mentioned so far, uh, Ajahn Chah, Jack's teacher, Mahasi Sayadaw, great Burmese master, Sunlun Sayadaw, Ma Mahasi, the mental noting, Sunlun, <laughs> intense breathing, Ajahn Buddha Dasa, Nothing to do, nothing to be, nothing to have. Ajahn Neb, the, the uh, 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 woman, uh, Theravadan master, female master, who talked about just noticing what gets you to move from one, one posture change to another, and you'll see that it's um, discomfort or uh, dukkha, suffering. Ajahn Mahabua, um, who um, talked about um, um, investigating the body uh, and uh, disenchantment with the body. And uh, Tangpulu Sayadaw also we did the 32 parts of the body meditation. And tonight, uh, Mogok Sayadaw. Um, here's a, a picture of Mogok. Probably you can't see but uh, if you're far away, but... Um, like many of the others, they're pretty serious, um, but I have a feeling great happiness inside. Um, I'm sure. I think that's the point. Um, but the, in the Burmese and Thai tradition, especially with the master, you, you didn't have a big toothy grin like this. Uh, and I think I mentioned that Mahasi Sayada would put a fan over his face if I, I was... In his, I was around him in, uh, in his presence, and when one would smile, you uh, put a fan up if you're a highly evolved being, because uh, it, at least in that custom, one doesn't smile and have, show a lot of, uh, of cheerfulness, I've been told, when there is so much suffering in the world. Or either that, or they just have this very kind of serious and um, uh, dignified demeanor. But um, I've also seen a lot of these, some of these masters really laugh, uh, if you could catch them. Ajahn Chah laughed all the time. Anyway, M Mogok um, was born in 1900, died in 1990, uh, 1962. And uh, his style of practice, like all of these masters, um, is based in the Satipatthana Sutta, the Discourse on Mindfulness. Last year we went through a series of, I think, 13 talks or so on the Satipatthana Sutta, which all of Buddhist meditation is based on. Uh, and it's a pretty large sutta, as we said. There's, th as I said, we gave 13 talks because there are many, many different aspects that the Buddha talked about as far as being mindful. 
One of them, for instance, when we did Tampulu last week, was on the 32 parts of the body. That's a particular focus, a uh, paragraph in the Satipatthana Sutta. Another one on getting up and lying down in all four postures. That's Ajahn Nebs looking at how you change your posture. Mogok's uh, practice focuses on uh, a couple of different aspects of the sutta in the in the fourth foundation of mindfulness where it talks about uh, mindfulness of um, of the different uh, of the sense spheres that is the eye the ear the nose the tongue the body and the mind and also mindfulness of the aggregates of the five aggregates, form, feeling, perception, mental formation, consciousness, and also mindfulness of feeling, of pleasantness, unpleasantness, and neutrality. And he put them into a, uh, a practice approach where you directly see what the Buddha was inviting us to see. That is, if you look very... Attentively, if one develops enough stability and composure of mind and concentration that you can see by looking at these areas that the Buddha suggested that we are not who we think we are. That we are not this solid, fixed, unchanging entity, but that we too are the process of life as it expresses itself through us, that we are a changing mind-body process. And there's nowhere in there that you can say, this is the essence of who I am. Because if it is all changing, if your mind and mind states are continually changing, and if your body is continually changing with sensations and processes continually in motion and movement, there's nothing fixed or abiding that one can see. And that was what the Buddha was pointing to, seeing through the illusion of a solid sense of self. Mm -mm. And uh, Mogok came up with a very interesting way to explore that. I'll mention a little bit about mm, his approach or his perspective for training. First he said that it's helpful to have some intellectual understanding of the Dharma before practicing it. So he was in favor of study and understanding certain concepts, particularly the law of dependent origination. Now, uh, I'm, uh, there's not going to be a test on any of this. Don't worry. I know I bandied about a few different things. Don't worry about any of this. Um, and one can study it and get a, a handle on dependent origination is a, is a, is a complex um, presentation of how we continually are on the wheel of suffering. Um, from having a body, we have contact. From having, uh, we have sense organs and consciousness. Sense organs and consciousness. We have contact with the outside world. So if you look at something because the eye sees and the consciousness is working and the, org and the uh, object is there, the three coming together give you contact. Oh, I see a cushion, a red cushion over there. From that contact comes some response usually one flavor of experience. Either you like what you see, you don't like what you see, or you don't care one way or another. It's neutral. Pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. That's in this dependent origination. If something is pleasant or unpleasant, we have a response. We want the pleasant, we don't want the unpleasant. From that, from that wanting, from that craving comes grasping, comes in the whole wheel becoming, comes old age, sickness, and death. And suffering keeps on coming when we are not clear at our responses to the world um, around us. So, 
Basically, he said, it's a good idea to have some intellectual understanding, conceptual understanding. Now, Ajahn Chah, if you recall way back, said, the only thing you have to study, the one book you have to study is this book, The Eightfold Path, Two Eyes, Two Ears, Two Nostrils, A Tongue, and a body, and mindfulness is what reveals everything to you. So he said, don't get bogged down with a whole lot of study. Uh, I don't want to confuse you, I just want you to see there's lots of different approaches. And in Mogok's approach, he said, having a basis, a foundation of intellectual understanding of Dharma is a good thing. And it is a good thing. It might Don't feel that you've got to be a Buddhist scholar, however, to get into what the practice has to offer. Then he said, from that understanding, um, you start to uh, meditate based on the understanding of these concepts. And he uh, said that it's a good thing to develop some concentration. Again, this is a topic from, from master to master. People have varying takes on. Some of these masters say, as we've said, uh, we've shown a few times, don't get caught in concentration. It's dangerous. If you get too much into it, you can get hooked on it. And others say concentration is absolutely essential. There's a middle path where some degree of mental composure which is what we do on retreats where there's a kind of mm, uh, secluded, supportive environment where you're not so scattered as you start to compose the mind, you can see things that are not normally available to your clarity and perception. And, but he thought concentration is a good thing and uh, to practice it on um, focusing on the in and out breath. He didn't say you have to go for high states of concentration, but he recommended actually when you sit, to sit for about 20 or 25 minutes using mindfulness of the breath at the nostrils as a way to collect the attention. And then after it's collected, to then turn that awareness onto the specific instructions that he Uh, suggested. And it's like one way I think of it is that the breath, when used as a concentration device, it's like a sharpening stone, you know, like a wedding stone. Okay, we can collect and sharpen the awareness on that one object, and with that more collected, composed, refined awareness, can notice whatever it is that we're paying attention to, whether it's in the body or the mind. And after developing concentration, um, then his instructions are meditating on consciousness and uh, or on feeling. And we'll explore both of those. And then as you develop the third part of the training besides the intellectual basis and the meditation based on that understanding, is you start to see, as you pay attention, that everything is arising and passing. And the more you see that, it's not just to notice, oh yes, here's a sound, or here's a a sensation, or here's uh, the... Uh, feeling in this moment pleasant, oh, this moment is unpleasant, this moment is neutral. Each moment has its own life. But he says, as you keep on developing and looking moment after moment after moment, the understanding that everything is constantly arising and passing away becomes revealed more and more, and as it becomes revealed more and more, then this solidity of who we think we are starts to break up. Mm. 
And he uses, um, we talked about mindfulness of the, um, the five aggregates that's, one, that's in the fourth foundation of mindfulness. The, the different aggregates, I'll just go through them briefly and, and, uh, and the way he thinks of it. There's the body form, and he said, take a look. If you're looking at the body, instead of seeing, oh, this is my body, Look at it in terms of elements. Here's hardness, maybe where your, your butt is on the cushion. Here's um, uh, fluidity. You might notice uh, a sense of, um, in the water element, first one's the earth element, then the water element, uh, the different flowing systems in your body. You know, your blood flowing through you. Or if you have a cold, it's a lot easier. You start to see the, feel the water element as it comes out your nostrils. And uh, the different... Uh, water is a sense of cohesion, how things stick together. The air element, which is uh, vibration, which you can feel in the movement of the breath. Or you can also feel in the vibration in the body. And then the fire element, you feel heat. So he says, okay, if you're going to pay attention to your body, uh, just notice instead of it being, oh, my, my buttock, you notice the hardness. Or this, my breath, you notice the feeling of, of movement, of vibration. And so the body starts to be teased apart in these four components. But he didn't mostly stay with the elements. He looked at the other aspects. He looked at the second aggregate, which is feeling, Vedana, that pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. That he stayed, uh, he focused a lot on. Then there's the perception element, form, feeling, perception, which is recognizing, oh, this is an animal, this is red, this is big, this is small. Then there's the mental uh, um, aggregate, mental factors. You notice the different states of consciousness coming and going. Sorry, the different um, aspects of mind coming and going. And then there's the consciousness element, which is how we know, how we take an experience. And he's particularly focused on the consciousness element and the feeling or Vedna element. <clears throat> The consciousness element is really how we know our world around us. If you open your eyes, without trying at all, you see objects. Try not to see. Look in front of you and try not to see. You can't even not see. Your eye works, there's an object, and there's the knowing of that object. So that's one way we take in the world. There is a consciousness that sees, which in Buddhist, um, in the Satipatthana Sutta, is called eye consciousness. And then there's hearing. Turning your awareness to sound, you can hear the, the heater starting to warm up the room. But actually you hear the heater, you don't, and you feel the effects, but if you're listening to the heater, try not knowing that the heater is going. You can't. Uh, maybe you can. If you can, tell me, but I can't anyway. That's ear consciousness. You have an organ that works. You have something that's making sound. And there's the knowing of it. Oh, and that's ear consciousness. And then you have nose consciousness. And you have tongue consciousness. That's how they refer, it, refer to it. Taste and smell. You have body consciousness, the different sensations inside, and you have 
consciousness of the mind and mind objects. You know that you're thinking or you know that you're feeling. So those are the six kinds of consciousness that the Buddha spoke of. The six sense spheres. Seeing, hearing, smelling, touching, tasting, and uh, mind. So he said, let's take a look at this. I'll read you a little bit of his approach. First, as far as why start with the mind. Where do we start? We must start with the, the mind, he says. The Buddha explained the importance of meditation on the mind. He said, I know of no other single dharma so conducive to great profit and benefit as the mind, which has been cultivated and developed. So that's where, you know, that was the line that Moguk said, oh, let's start with the mind. Now, next week, We'll be looking at um, uh, Uba Ken, who is Goenka's teacher, who said, just stay with the body. And that's the way to do it. So there's so many different ways. But he says, let's start with the mind. Then he says, Some say that it is the. Uh, wait, sorry. We emphasize meditation on the mind to eliminate the prevalence of a deep rooted, rooted wrong view which regards consciousness as permanent or self or soul, even among many Buddhists. Almost all Buddhists are under the wrong impression that a soul transmigrates or reincarnates from one existence to another. Have you ever thought about rebirth and, and see, well, what is it that gets reborn? He says, if you think that there's some kind of soul reborn, you, are, you have a misunderstanding. Um, and as you might know, the, the term anatta, no soul or no self, uh, is, is a key in, in Buddhist meditation. He says... Some go further to say it's the soul which departs the body on the death of a being. Some believe that the soul does not depart the body as long as there's no vacancy in which to dwell, but hangs around until there arises a suitable place to re be reborn. This kind of wrong view is deeply rooted and handed down from generation to generation. Such beliefs as transmigration of the soul or reincarnation from one existence to another are incorrect. Such wrong views are harbored and maintained because of the belief that consciousness is enduring and permanent and lasts even when the body perishes. Now, if you're saying, well, wait a minute, I, that makes sense to me. Just suspend all your views. That's the key with this all. Who knows? <laughs> but... Be open to the possibility that it's not what you might think it is. But this key of consciousness lasting is, is very important in his approach. Consciousness, too, is impermanent and is subject to an endless process of arising and passing. It arises for a moment in space and time and cannot move a single inch from where it arises nor remain the same for two consecutive moments. He says, if you take a look, it's always one moment of consciousness arising and passing, followed by another moment of consciousness arising and passing, again and again and again. And if you see this clearly, then the whole solidity starts to break up. And he says that not only one consciousness, not only that only one consciousness can arise at a time, but that we can look at consciousness not just in terms of those six that I mentioned, but actually he divides it into 
13 consciousnesses, which is part of his instructions. So this is not just filler. He says there's eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, tongue, body, desiring consciousness, aversive consciousness, deluded consciousness, non-greedy consciousness, non-hateful consciousness, and mind consciousness, and in-breathing consciousness, and out-breathing consciousness. Those are his 13 kinds of consciousness. He says, check out. And this is part of his meditation instructions. Okay. So, reference to the list of the 13 kinds of consciousness is invited. There is desiring consciousness and wishing to eat, to smell, etc. Jealousy and ill will are classified as aversion consciousness, while thought to do service or charity, charity comes under non-greed consciousness. When we open our eyes, we see everything as colors and shapes before our eyes. This is the arising of eye consciousness. And the yogi must comprehend and be cognizant of this arising when it occurs. When he hears a sound, ear consciousness arises, and this arising must be cognized and comprehended. If he or she feels any irritation or itch, any pleasurable or unpleasurable feeling, there arises body consciousness. The yogi must comprehend and be cognizant of each new arising and vanishing of consciousness, one at a time. I'll read a little bit more. In the course of practice, the comprehension or insight of the yogi becomes more pronounced, distractions disappear, and mindfulness becomes centered only on the arising and the vanishing. The awareness of arising and vanishing of consciousness then becomes more rapid. Now, this is where concentration helps, because as you start to develop some concentration, you start to see the subtleties of experience. And because you're not distracted, for instance, you might notice, oh, here's hearing consciousness. And then you feel an itch. Oh, here's itching consciousness or body consciousness. Oh, here's, uh, you see an image. Here's sight consciousness. And if you're really there, it's like you're watching the, the frames of a movie oh, there's this frame, there's this frame, there's this frame, there's this frame. Is this, are you with me so far? Does this make sense? Okay. So, the awareness becomes more rapidly, more rapid. Generally, at this point, the yogi clearly sees with insight that whatever consciousness arises, it terminates in the next instant. instant. You can see that no consciousness can remain for two successive moments the same. The lifespan of consciousness is momentary. Hence, when the yogi meditates or observes consciousness, they will find only change, the perishing or vanishing of each consciousness. If on initial observation they find that consciousness does not vanish or disappear, they cannot pass beyond the notion of permanence. They must endeavor then with more concentration and mindfulness perceive the nature of the arising and perishing of the aggregates. Let's see if I have anything else to do. Okay. So then, rather than, we'll do it uh, for a few moments, rather than focusing on the objects, this is what often we're trained to do. Oh, here's a sight, here's a sound, here's a sensation. It's a shift to focus on the consciousness that knows that. It's subtle, but if you get the hang of it, it's just turning it, coming back to the awareness of the object rather than the object itself. So let's just play around with this for a little while. Just sit here and you don't have to 
try to get very concentrated. Just know what is happening, what your experience is in this moment. Which sense are you aware of? We, we just can hold, hang out with the six sense doors. Don't worry about the 13 right now. And whatever it is in this moment, if it's hearing, you know, then rather than going to the, the blower, go to the consciousness that knows. Oh, here's hearing consciousness. If it's a sensation in the, in the body, rather than going out to that sensation, be aware of the consciousness that knows it. Here's body consciousness. And I'll be quiet, and for the next couple of minutes, see if you can notice the changing, arising and passing of the various consciousnesses. It's one of six things, either the five physical senses or mind consciousness. Let's see which ones. Anytime you get lost or confused, you don't have to backtrack. Just start right in the moment that you Remember, you're here. See if you can be attentive, but not tight. Just relax and let the experience reveal itself. Let yourself gently come out of it. Check in before we, there's one other practice. What was that? Anything that you notice? Anybody? Did it drive you crazy? Was it fun? What did you see? Yeah. Is that Allison? Well, I've been um, working with the, the aggregates for a while and. Um, so I'm, this was a little exciting to hear this because I'm like, oh, a teaching on this. And um, my, I get a little uh, frustrated around the, the consciousness of consciousness and the consciousness of mind. Um, there are graceful moments of consciousness of other senses without, with a new, new, neutrality, so there's not a lot of grasp or whatever. But the mind and the consciousness, the consciousness of consciousness and consciousness of mind. It's like one of those um, Chinese finger torture things. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, the harder you pull, the tighter it gets. Yeah. And I yeah. just keep doing it and keep practicing yeah. with it, but wow, I wonder if there's ever going to be any sort of... Well, here's the thing. You can't pounce on it. You can't, if you, really what you're doing is, uh, and he makes this point too, you're aware of the preceding moment of consciousness. And he makes this point later on, what you're you're seeing is, um, is the object and the impermanent nature of it. You see, impermanence, and then you have an insight into impermanence. You see the object, and you see 
then you realize that it's gone, and it's a moment of realizing that it's gone. And so, I don't, I wouldn't try too hard to be in the moment and have your awareness catch itself. Uh, just, just relax. They just seem like the same thing. It's not so much that I'm pouncing yeah. as, uh, I mean, I know it's all a system and it all works together, but I, I'm not sure how insight can come since they seem so connected, so like glued like one side to the other so you can never see the other side kind of thing. Yeah. It's like uh, there are some approaches to practice that specifically direct you to this so that you see the emptiness of mind. You can't catch it. In, in Tibetan practice, in some very profound um, teachings, it's attempting to do exactly what you do, what you're saying, and you see the whole game just kind of vanishes. There's, there's a, um, for a moment, there's a gap. So, in one, in one practice, you might be trying to notice, and in another, you see that it's, it's impossible to notice. That we had a, 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 a teacher here who recently passed away. If you remember uh, Douglas Harding, he was like, he came here, he was like 96 or so, and he was amazing, this ball of energy and inspiration. And his main practice that he taught for like, you know, 60 years or so is um, what he called on having no head. That you can't see yourself. It's like the eye trying to look at itself. Right? And once you see that, you see there is, uh, there's no reference back. It's just awareness shining through. And if you try to look at yourself, you know, you're, you're uh, well, it's just having that perspective of not being, of the awareness not being able to see itself just shining through. So I would say just really lighten up and... Uh, and I'm sorry, I didn't mean to come across as that I, that I get frustrated. Oh, yeah, I, no. I just, it's just this... I, well, I'm, I'm saying it as much for myself because I, <laughs> because I tried many times to catch my consciousness and just relax into the mystery of it. Okay. Anything else that, that came up? Just noticing the consciousness coming and going. Yeah, right by Maya. Um, hello. Uh, I felt like I was more conscious as I paid attention to my consciousness. I felt like I was more in a in a state of self, like self. That consciousness felt like something. Where whereas it, normally, if I just noticed my hearing or just it, the mystery sort of naturally happens, but when I started to ref, self reflect. It mm. felt like I was getting caught up in my e- an ego thing somehow. Uh huh. A self consciousness. Say, can you say a, a, any more how how it how it would feel? Um, like? Well, it's just in comparison to how I normally practice this. It's just sort of noting the hearing and not thinking about myself hearing, but just noting the hearing as a experience without ref- self referencing. I see. So it was yeah. it was coming back to the the sense of. The self that's having yeah. the consciousness. But I mean, I, I you know, I don't know. Mm-hmm. And this is just, you know, the, the, a short experiment. And I could see where that it kind of come, brings you back to here instead of right. instead of free flowing, opening to the experience. But what he says is, as you keep on doing it, you see there is no self. What you thought was the self, it's just consciousness happening on its own, coming and going. And I can. I, I can understand that that new shift of perspective. It's it's a little unsettling or jarring, and 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 uh, can be mm, not very helpful. But if it is, if you just see, oh, this thing that I call mind or self is just mm-hmm. consciousness. All right, I see what you're saying. Okay. Anything else uh, before we go on? What's that? No, is there, was there, oh yeah, oh Louise. Yeah. Me 
two things. Um, one is I felt like because the assignment was to notice which consciousness was happening, um, I felt like I let go of whatever was happening quicker than I usually do. So it was kind of taking a snapshot. There's ear consciousness. Oh, there's body consciousness. And it seemed like it was all happening a lot quicker. Mm-hmm. And the other thing was I was trying to figure out if, if it was in doing this sort of assignment that you gave us, if the mind, it seemed like my mind did not go into thoughts as much as it usually does because it was essentially thinking about <laughs> which form of consciousness was happening. So it had something to do that was not um, allowing as many thoughts to come in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, beautiful. He says, he makes the point, if there can be a continuous... Um, awareness of the various consciousnesses that with no breaks, you're on your way to um, the first stage of enlightenment here. It says, when there are only a few misses in the yogi's observation and watchfulness, it can be said that they have developed their insight to some extent. When they're able to follow the process of arising and perishing without allowing any defilement to come in between, it can be said they have reached the stage where they can shatter the false view of self. Because you're not caught in, in your thoughts. At that point, the first stage of enlightenment is near. Keep it up. <laughs> uh, imagine if you can do that over a stretch of an hour or two or over, over a stretch of days and you start seeing this thing that we call mind or me or mine seen through, then you, the whole self starts to dissolve. Okay, so let's go on to the second, second part, which is mindfulness of feeling. Now, this is again in the Satipatthana Sutta, the second foundation, pleasant unpleasantness and neutrality. He says, there's uh, feelings at the eye, ear, nose, tongue. He, he says all of those are neutral. Um, I, and I don't know exactly why. But he says body can have pleasant or unpleasant or neutral. And then the mind can have pleasant, unpleasant or neutral. And then there's the in-breath and out-breath. Pleasant, uh, pleasant, unpleasant or neutral. And this is what he says. Mm. The important point for the yogi is that he must contemplate on feeling where where and when it arises. It has been a practice elsewhere to fix attention on the chest or on the head, feeling the breath, but feeling appears anywhere in the body, wherever there is contact. So it cannot be said that this sort of practice is right in his mind. It is like aiming an arrow at the wrong target. Nobody can fix feeling in any particular place. It will arise wherever there is sense object preceding. If a yogi believes that the feeling he meditates on in one moment is the same one as in another moment, he has a long way to go. It should be cognized and seen with insight that each feeling is transient, impermanent, and never remains the same for two consecutive moments. If the yogi fails to cognize and perceive with insight wisdom that feeling is impermanent, he is still off the track. It is generally and wrongly believed that feeling is one long continuous experience, but with mindfulness and concentration, the yogi will see all feeling as arising and ceasing moment to moment. So, this, he has an, an extra credit mindfulness of feeling. Because it's not only mindfulness of, oh, this moment is a pleasant moment or an unpleasant moment, but, oh, here's a moment of consciousness, uh, of body consciousness, which is unpleasant. Here's a moment of, of eye consciousness, which is neutral. Here's a moment of mind consciousness, which is pleasant. So it gets a little complicated when you're not only seeing what the consciousness is, but whether it's pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. Let's just for a little while make it very simple, and then maybe we can do a, uh, if, 
a minute or so with the, with the uh, advanced. Just for a moment, close your eyes. And right now, see in your experience if this moment is pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. And whatever it is, is absolutely fine. You might be bored, ready to go, a little unpleasant. might be excited or might be just neutral. Now see about this moment. Now this one. And for the next minute or so, keep on noticing the flavor of experience. One of three flavors in any one moment. And now just add on which sense store this pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral experience is. Moment of ear consciousness, pleasant. Moment of body consciousness. I had the same experience this time as I I had the same experience this time as I had in the first exercise which was at first very slow noticing hearing consciousness 
nose consciousness sensation, and then it would accelerate and accelerate and accelerate and accelerate until I couldn't label them anymore. It was just the awareness of each one passing and, and a new one coming up. And it was the same thing here. I would attach a word to it, you know, pleasant, neutral, unpleasant. And then after a while, just and it was delightful, actually, to be sort of watching it flow and flow and flow and change and change and change. Everything is arising and passing away so rapidly, the, the whole solidity itself dissolves. And it's, um, mm -hmm. and it's, uh, that's the root of the problem. How many people notice how, how much the uh, flavor changed? It's very fascinating to do this in your daily life. Besides your formal meditation, I would encourage you, if you feel like it, explain it. Oh, can I pass that on? I would encourage it uh, to play with it in your daily practice, just wherever you happen to be. If you're feeling bummed out, okay, say, oh, unpleasant, unpleasant. But if you pay careful attention, you might notice some pleasant moments interspersed in that unpleasant, what we're labeling, rotten day. Oh, this is a pleasant moment. Oh, it's even more pleasant to notice. Oh, this is pleasant. Oh, now it's kind of boring. Now it's unpleasant. Now it's, and you're going throughout your day so many different coming and going moods. So much faster that we think, then we think, but we just co cover it up and say, because we're not aware, oh, today's a great day. And you might have had a few thousand unpleasant moments in there. Or today's a rotten day. And you might have had a few thousand pleasant moments. It's not as solid as it seems. So uh, have fun with that this week. I would encourage you, even when it's unpleasant, have fun. And see how fast everything changes. Okay, so we'll we'll close in uh, with a short loving kindness. Next week we will do Ubakin, which is uh, the sweeping practice that Goenka teaches. Just feel your heart center. Breathe in benevolent energy. Let it fill you. Breathe out. Let it surround and radiate out. May I see clearly. May I awaken to the truth of how things are. May my heart open with that truth and share my love well. May I be happy. And then to extend that out, everybody around you and in all directions to all beings, as I want to be happy, may all be happy. May all see clearly and wake up to their true nature. May all share their love well. And may our coming together whatever wisdom and goodness that we develop together, may it be shared with all beings for the benefit of all beings. May all beings be happy.
Thank you very much.